Again, folks, what hope we have because he is risen. I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew 28 and we'll read about the ladies coming to the tomb again. Uh, now, before we, we do that, it's important that you understand that in our church, we believe in God's word. We believe in this book. We, 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 it's not just a, a good book, but it is a perfect book. Sound like Donald Trump. The bloody book, the bloody book, the bloody book, the bloody book, the bloody book. <laughs> but we believe that it is very much a perfect book. Inspired by God. It is not what God might say to us if he was here this morning. And it's up to us to interpret it and try to understand it. No. It is what God is saying because he is here and this is his word to us. A lot of people don't like the argument, well, the Bible says. And I understand that it can maybe come across as just blind faith. And you know how I feel about blind faith. I've made it very clear over the last couple of weeks. I don't like the term about going in just blindly to believing in things. I don't like the implications. I don't like the inference that that makes. The Bible can be logically, historically proven to be accurate again and again and again and again. All right, The Marvel Cinematic Universe can't do it over 20 years. Never mind a millennium of biblical writers across cultures and languages and continents. And yet the Bible holds up to the critique far more than any series of books or movies or TV shows or whatever. In fact, the biblical records go right back to the ancient world and have remained intact despite dictator after dictator after dictator trying to stop the Bible from going out and being spread most documents don't survive that kind of scrutiny. Most documents don't, just, don't haven't survived that time frame at all. People try to preserve them. Yet one scholar has said that if, if you take all the other works of antiquity from AD 40, AD 50, AD 60, that time frame, whenever the biblical accounts were starting to be written, you could put them on between two bookends about a foot apart. That's all we have. And yet when you go to the New Testament alone, you find something interesting. There's an abundance of manuscripts, over 6,000 manuscripts from that time frame. Okay, if you take all the other parts and partial copies that we have, it's 24,000 copies of the Old Testament, all showing that it is accurate and consistent to what we have today. Okay, the earliest part of the Bible we have comes to 30 years in around the, the after the life of John, it's the, the Gospel of John is the, the earliest that we have. And that dates to about AD 120 or so. 30 years after John originally penned. It could very easily be the original. <clears throat> and I'm bringing that up because everybody wants to knock the Bible. How can you believe a dusty old book? How can you believe something that was written so many years ago by people who are long dead? It's invalid, you can't trust it. And, and yet nobody disses on any of the other writings that we have. You know, some of the most accurate, famous literary figures that we have, from Tacitus, the Roman historian, two dozen partial copies there there about 750 years after tacitus originally wrote them we've no idea how much they have changed in that 750 year window but we take it as gospel so to speak that's the history from tacitus that's what he said that's what he wrote but we've no way of showing that it's exactly what he wrote his other copies, you have to go to the 11th century. That's when the Battle of Hastings was being fought. Same as Josephus, the Jewish historian, 11th century. And how many New Testament manuscripts are there by comparison in the original language? 5,000 copies dated to within a century of the original. Next one that comes close is Homer's Iliad. And it's got nowhere near the reliability. It's still over 400 years away from the original. 5,000 copies, handwritten copies of the New Testament, a generation or two after the originals, when people could verify that, yes, this is the same, they could compare the ones with the one before. This carries weight in terms of historical accuracy when you consider that these copies are coming from all corners of the globe. 
any historian who questions the reliability, the authenticity of scripture, you have to throw out everything we know about the world up until 16th, 17th century to match the body of evidence we have through the Bible. The New Testament is unrivaled in its accuracy down through the ages. The sheer volume of copies <coughs> testifies to the lack of variance, to the precise nature of it. This book is an errand. It is a perfect book. It's precise, so we trust the reliability and the durability of this book. And that's important whenever we come then to read about the resurrection. And let's do that now. Matthew 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And so the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. So here we have this passage that marks out the Bible as being unreliable, untrustworthy, discredited in most people's eyes. You can't believe a book that tells you this nonsense. You can't believe a book that would start going through things like this. And yet here we have it written very clearly for our eyes to see. Jesus Christ is risen. And the angel suggests four things for the ladies to do with this information. Four invitations to respond this Easter. The angel says to them, come and see. And then he says, go and tell. And that, what I want to do is I want to call this message very simply. Four things to do this Easter. Come and see. Go and tell. Now, please don't misunderstand what is happening. The angel doesn't show up to shift the stone so that Jesus can get out. That's not what's happening here. The angel is there for the ladies so that they can get in. So he could offer them and you the same invitation to come and see the place where he lay. Come and see the empty tomb. I've been to Israel, as some of you have. I've been in Jerusalem. I've been to where they have decided is the most likely place to be where Jesus has been buried. Can't be entirely sure, to be honest. It's all very different now. It's uh, very underwhelming, to be honest with you. It's very touristy. And, and you're trying to sort of have this kind of moment here, and then there's a tour guide kind of pushing you out of the way and shoving you into the floors. It's like, mm, this is really spiritual. I actually preached in the garden tomb, led communion service there, and I was, I actually did the point there and then that it was underwhelming and I was surprised that I hadn't got this kind of big Jesus moment while I was standing right there in the place that it all happened, allegedly. And I realized as I was talking to them that despite God being omnipresent, despite God being everywhere, this is the one place in the Bible says that he is not. He isn't here. He's risen. But these ladies, they come and see that the stone is rolled away and they're invited to come and step into the tomb and see where Jesus lay, or at least the kind of place where he was going to lay. And truthfully, maybe you've heard this or not, I don't know, but um, <coughs> in the 80s, 1980s, about 40 years ago, call it 40 years ago, uh, there was this big hoo-ha um, that there was an, um, an archeological dig in Jerusalem and they found uh, a tomb and in it they had these little, without going into how the, the Jewish people used to do it, effectively once the body decomposed they put their bones into like these little boxes and kind of stored them on shelves and so all the families were stayed together. And they went in and they found this area of sort of two century, uh, two millennia old bones and boxes and on it was the names of Jesus or Yeshua and then you had Mary and Joseph and, and different ones. 
And they went, aha, after all these years we found it, we have found the body of Jesus. It proves that Christianity is not real. And they did, they did find the body of someone called Jesus, Mary and Joseph. But truthfully, they also found 119 other tombs with Jesus and Mary and Joseph. All they did was realize that these names were really popular 2,000 years ago. There was lots of people called Yeshua, lots of people called Mary, lots of people called Joseph. It wasn't the aha moment that they thought it was. But this angel speaks to these ladies and gives this invitation. Come. Come. Come and see. This is the right tomb. This is the place where Jesus was. But come closer. Take a closer look. It's a very simple invitation. But one I'm sure the ladies were reluctant to take initially. It been very easy. I mean, graveyards, let's be honest, they're scary places. All right, they're kind of freaky. All right, and whenever it's early light and maybe the sun's still not quite as high as you'd like it to be, and there's a bit of mist coming rolling through, it's kind of like, oh, this is. Do you hear anything? No, no, it's just me. And then some freaky stuff starts happening, and you're like, nope, not today, ghosts, and you're wrong, right? Because that's what would happen, right? You just go, well, I'll come back at lunchtime, I'm going to go have a coffee, I'm going to go to make sure I'm awake, I'm going to just come back later. Because they're looking for a dead guy. They're not looking for angels. They're not looking for resurrections. And most people are the same. Why bother coming? Why bother? Jesus is dead. It's a dead religion. All religions are dead. Why bother coming? What are you expecting to find? Why would you bother coming? Just a load of weird Christians. Just stay away. And you'll probably lose count of the number of documentaries and newspaper articles that are written and editorials about all the hoax theories about why Christians think Jesus is alive and why that they're wrong. And we went through a lot of them in the very first episode uh, and first part in the series. It's available online if you want to go back and have a look at how we debunk some of the alternatives to the resurrection. But another reason not to come might not just be the fact that it was a wee bit scary, but the fact that the Roman soldiers were there, okay? They come to these butch men, these war battle-hardened men. They don't want a reputation being put on their backs by women. They don't want to go around telling ghost stories. So they might just like to overcompensate a little bit. You don't want to be around when these guys come to you. They'll be angry. They might get a wee bit stabby. So you go, I'm going to back away here. There was plenty of reasons to not hang about. There was plenty of reasons where rational people might think, I'll, I'll come back to this at a more opportune time. But the voice speaks to them, come. Now is the time, come now. That instant refreshing invitation that marked Jesus' life throughout the Bible, it was his constant message. Forget about everything else. Don't worry about whatever else happening. Just come. Just come. You never read a Jesus saying, go away, or ugh, I didn't come for your type of people. No, the invitation was to the sick, to the poor, to the needy, to the sinner, to the uh, rebel. There's no exceptions. Whoever you are, just come. He didn't care what other people thought of him. He didn't care what religious <coughs> people thought about those kinds of people coming to him. He didn't care about any of that. He didn't care if it made them lower in, in reputation by their standards. His attitude was always the same. No, just come. In Matthew 11, he says, Come unto me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Anyone stressed? Anyone panic, anyone worried, anyone anxious, anyone come to Jesus, come and lay your burdens down. John 7, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Anyone got that wall that just doesn't feel full? That thing that sort of makes it goes, there's got to be more. I'm missing something in life. It feels like even though I've got my relationships and I've got some income and I've got some friends and I've got the, it seems like there's still something missing. There's this wall that's not satisfying. Jesus says, come. Or even at the very last page in the Bible, Revelation 22, 
the invitation goes out one last time. Whosoever will may come. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what the baggage is. It doesn't matter what the skeletons in the closet are. It doesn't matter what's going on. The invitation is for you. Just come. Just come. Which is so different to what a lot of people think religion's about. All right? That's why we don't do religion here in AAC. We, all right, I've been quite vocal about this. I hate religion. All right? It's, it's no use to anyone. Because what religion will do is says, look, you can't just rock up to God. You, you can't just show up. That doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You've got to put the work in first. Clean up your act. Get your Ten Commandments on. Pray. Tithe. Ooh, God loves it when you tithe. And then you can come because he'll listen to you then. No. That's not the Bible. Come as you are. Come warts and all. The real you just come. It's the only way to come to Jesus. To really come to Jesus. In fact, Jesus actually said to the religious people, Woe unto you, for you put burdens on the shoulders of the people. The language of religion says, You're not good enough. Stay away. You have to prove your worth before you come. But the message at Easter from the Saviour is come. Just this invitation. <clears throat> if you want to, you may come. And I'm really glad that you're all here at church this morning. But coming to church isn't enough to save you. And it isn't enough to change you. At best... It'll give you an hour to catch up on your sleep, all right? Hey, you're not the only one, okay? But I pray this morning that you would come to Jesus. So come, but don't just come blindly, okay? We don't do things blindly by faith here, okay, in the church. We want to come and see. Come and see where he laid. That idea of, of, of seeing is more than just looking and being kind of not bumping into stuff. Okay, the idea is come and check it out. Okay, when my kids come to me and say, Dad, Dad, come and see, come and see, come and check this out. Look at this TikTok, look at this stuff that they're doing, look at this. Right? It's come and pay attention to this. Come and observe it. Come and be excited about the thing that we're excited about. That's what they say when they say come and see. And that's what this word means. Get excited. Come to Jesus <laughs> and get excited about what you can see. And so here is this angel saying, like, you're expecting a dead saviour. No, that's no use to anyone. Come to a living and raising saviour who has defeated death and sin. Come and check it out. Come and get excited about this. And here is the thing. that Once you come to Jesus, you will see. You will see a real change in your life. I heard about an atheist who was giving lectures and he was going around and his theme of the month has, was the foolishness of Christianity. And there was a Q&A afterwards and when the Q&A began, there was a guy who was a fairly infamous alcoholic in the time, uh, not that old, in his sort of mid-twenties, and uh, he, um, he came down and he joined the queue for the microphone to ask the, his question. And when he got to the front, he kind of just stood and he put, put an orange out he started peeling the orange and started eating the orange. And everyone's just kind of watching a guy eat an orange for some reason. And the sort of lecturer kind of dismissed said, like, and you got a question at any point here, there's a cue. The man finished his orange and goes, I do have a question actually. Was the orange I just ate sweet or bitter? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? I haven't tasted it. How am I supposed to know? And so the young man turned around and says, exactly. So how can you know anything about Jesus if you have not tasted what he has to offer? Come and see. Come and check it out. But what would these women have seen when they looked into the tomb? I think when you see an empty tomb, you see Christ's humility. You look in and you see how God was willing to come and lower himself to save you. How far he would stoop to make himself available for us to come to him. Philippians 2 says that when he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, he was found in the human form, humbling himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is the one who made the world. In fact, we're told in Colossians that the whole world was made through him and for him and is held together by him. And yet he stepped into that world, out of heaven, came to die for our sins so that we could come to God. There's a lot of men throughout history who have themselves thought of as gods. But history only speaks of one God who would become man. The humility of Christ. Second thing I think these ladies would see is the reality of sin. If you want to see what your sin will do, you stand at the foot of a tomb. The consequences of sin, the result of rejecting God is death. Why? Because God is the one who offers us life, eternal life. He is the resurrection and the life. So if we reject the one who gives us life, what are we left with? And so I know it's not a popular thing to say. People don't want to think of themselves as sinners. And certainly it is now culturally more offensive to call out something as being wrong than actually doing anything wrong. (coughs) The 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice and the other 10 don't really matter anymore, should they don't? It's kind of where we're at. But listen to what Isaiah says. Isaiah 53 says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray and turned. Every one of us to his own way. But the Lord laid on him (coughs) the iniquity of (coughs) us all. In, In sign language, if you want to sign the name for Jesus, what you do is you point to the nail marks in his hands. That's how you sign the name of Jesus. It is the focal point. The sacrifice that he made says it all. It's in his name. The humility of Christ, the reality of sin. I think the third thing you would say is the mortality of man. These ladies stood in a graveyard surrounded by tombs. They came to see a murdered friend's resting place. And twice in the last three weeks, I have stood by a graveside and watched a coffin get lowered into the ground. And the one thing you cannot deny is that it is appointed unto men once to die. We cannot avoid that inevitability. We don't like thinking about it. But the truth is, we know it. We know that we have a limited amount of time in this life. The humility of God, the reality of sin, the mortality of men. But the fourth thing you would see is Christ's victory. Why? Because what do you go into an empty tomb expecting to see? Nothing. Because it's empty. Right? You're not expecting to see anything. So that was the point. The angel said, come and see. What are you looking for? He's not there. He's not here. He's risen. The story goes over a Muslim in Central Africa who got the see if he became a Christian very dangerous thing to do in in Islam it's something that can get you kicked out of your home kicked out of your family, kicked out of your job it's a very um, severe thing to do, it's a very uh, heavy thing to do and some of his close friends came along and said, look, we're not here to hurt you we're not here to harm you, but you've got to explain to us why you're doing this thing and this is what he said to them he says, suppose you're going down the road and suddenly there's a fork in the road and at that fork of the road, um, you, you don't know which way to go, but there's two men. One is dead and one is alive. Which man do you ask directions for? Now it's enough for him. He says, I'm going to ask the one who's alive to steer me, to guide me through life. Not the one who's dead. So come and see. Let's just bundle the next two together. Go and tell. When you've seen it for yourself, once you've got excited about that thing that you've seen, then don't stay there. Don't stay here. Go and tell. The angel wanted fascination to become proclamation, right? It's like, okay, now we've got something to talk about. Now we've got something to say. We've got something to hold on to. Something to tell the world that's wondering what happened to Jesus, right? Let's go tell them what happened to Jesus. We have to be really careful that we don't turn an empty tomb into a holy relic. Or it's like the 
the Barney Stone, where everyone just makes their way down. And we give it a rub, we give it a kiss. Brings us luck. You don't want to make the empty tomb just an academic pursuit where people write papers on it. Um, it all sounds very clever. No, but Jesus said, go into the world and tell everyone. Let them see the change that this has made in your life. That you have tasted the goodness of God in your life. That it makes a real difference. And so because I know many of you are saved here in church this morning, let me remind you the call on your life is to go and tell. That is why we are here. Because here is something that an unbelieving world really struggles with. Why are Christians so boring? Oh, why is it the Christians always seem so glum? Look, the world may not always agree with what we're saying, but they should be able to deny the joy that is radiating out of us. And it really bugs me. We were talking about this in small group during the week. It bugs me how you hear some people tell their story of what God has done in their life. And it's like, oh man, before I was saved, it was all these parties, and it was girl after girl after girl, and I was doing drugs, and I was, yeah, I was having the best time ever. And then it's like they turn into Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. And then I met Jesus, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think you should come to Jesus too, and you can be as happy as I am. And you think, I think I'd rather go to the parties, to be honest with you. It sounds like a lot more fun. Why is it that we get so boring and dull about this? We're not exactly doing it justice, are we? The love and joy and peace that floods in when the Spirit of God starts to indwell us and that fruit that we're supposed to start bearing, that has to come out. So we go and we tell so that others might come and see. There was an old English preacher called William Sangster. Um, he had a disease that slowly paralyzed him and even his vocal cords eventually went. And so he was a preacher who could no longer preach. Uh, he was a singer who could no longer sing. And really the last thing to go was a couple of, a bit of movement in his fingers and in his wrist. Just before he passed away, it happened to fall on Easter. And he wrote a note to his daughter and it said how terrible it is to wake up on Easter Sunday and not have a voice to sing, he is risen. But then he continued. It says, but far worse to have a voice and not want to shout. Go and tell. Now, listen, if you're not a Christian, and by that, I don't mean, oh, I identify as a Protestant, or I identify as a Catholic, or your parents took you to church when you were younger, or your granny let you read her Bibles a couple of times. No. What I mean is that if you do not have a real relationship with the risen Savior, that you do not know for sure that your sins are forgiven, and you, can, and you know that the Spirit of God has been working in you and producing that fruit, and there's change, and it's real... If that does not des describe and define you, the first thing you need to do is come and see. Come again and come again and come again until you see the power and the wonder of the cross and the risen, resurrected Saviour and receive him as your Saviour and find that life is so much more satisfying and fulfilling when he is in control. You ever hear of Easter Island? Uh, it's called Easter Island uh, because Dutch sailors discovered it on Easter Sunday. Now, if you wanted to find it, you'd have to sort of set sail from New Zealand and kind of like aim for Peru. And you kind of, that's kind of where you would go. Um, it's what is known as a navigational island. Because there is so much just empty water around it for like hundreds and thousands of miles, Whether you are sailing or whether you are flying, many people will use Easter Island as a way of gauging where they are in relation to everything else in the world. It's a marker to get their bearings right. Easter this morning is an awful lot like that. 
an island in the middle of a self-indulgent materialistic ocean that doesn't satisfy, that offers nothing. Easter can help you navigate your way through this world to find direction, to find the right way to go, to get your bearings right, because Easter points us to a risen Saviour who died to take away our sin and give us life abundant. So many Christians, they come and see, and they don't, they don't live that out. We were talking last week about what we're saved from and what we're saved to, and the joy and the fullness that comes whenever we then start acting out on that. something that Ruth and I, whenever we're chatting to people, we're trying to make plans over the next day or two to catch up with people and do things. And <clears throat> the thing that we're always asking is, so what are you doing over Easter? What are you doing over Easter? Can we fit things in? Can we make it all, uh, all these demands and all the social calendars fit in? Can I urge you to do these four things before you even leave church this morning? Come and see. Come and see the empty tomb. Come and see a risen Savior. Come and see what he can offer you. And then be resolved to go and tell. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that comes from Easter. Lord, we thank you for the invitation that comes with Easter. That we are not asked to just believe in a philosophy. We're not expected just to come and put our trust in a couple of vague ideas that a guy used to say to a few of his friends. But rather we are invited to come and see our risen Savior. Father, we thank you that despite millennia of people trying to destroy Christianity with rational, logical thinking, they have failed to do so because the word of God stands perfect, accurate, reliable, unshaking. And so, Lord, we come, we put our trust in this book, and this book says that if anyone comes to you, you will not turn them away. That, that you're willing for everyone to come and be saved if they will only repent. So, Lord, I pray that there will not be one person here this morning who would leave this church without knowing that this invitation is for them. That the Saviour is waiting for them. And I pray, Lord, that they would respond by saying, I want to know him. I want him to be my Saviour. I want this life that people are talking about that I just can't seem to find. Lord, that life that is only available by your spirit. And so, Lord, we ask this in your name.